Welcome to the second session of the conference. Before we proceed to the pre uh, presentations, I would like to express special thanks uh, to the organizing organizers of the conference for bringing us together in this beautiful historic building. I'm honored to be chair of the session with such distinguished colleagues. This panel has three speakers. Each speaker will have 20 minutes. After the presentations, there will be questions and answer sessions. Our, our, our fir, uh, uh, first speaker is uh, Professor Feroz uh, Yasemi, uh, formerly from Manchester University. He'll be talking about the Ottoman decisions for war. And our second uh, speaker is Professor Feroz Ahmed from uh, Yeditepe University. Uh, the title of his paper is Unionist Failure to Stay Out of the War, October, November 1914. And uh, our last uh, uh, panelist is Dr. Gül Tokay. Her title is Ottoman Diplomacy and the Origins of the Great War. And I'm very much interested in to hear what they all have to say. Now I would like to give the floor to Professor Yasemi. Okay. Uh -huh. Green button. That's the green button, I think. Yeah. First, I'd uh, like to thank the organizers for inviting me. I'm particularly grateful because this has given me an opportunity to look again at something I looked at and published a piece on decades ago. Uh, it's always useful to come back. Um, even if you haven't got any new information, you can bring a broader historical experience, and uh, that's what I intend to try and apply today. The Ottoman Empire's decision in 1914 to enter the First World War on the side of Germany and Austria-Hungary was controversial at the time, and has remained a subject of debate and dispute ever since. There's no evidence that it was driven by popular enthusiasm or pressure. After the unsuccessful Tripolitanian and Balkan conflicts, the Ottoman public was war-weary. Only the Ottoman officer corps, anxious to show what it could do, and in particular, to erase the shame of the army's failure in the first Balkan war, appears to have welcomed it. The Ottoman cabinet itself was divided and the eventual decision to open hostilities, concerted in secret by a handful of leading men and presented to their colleagues as a fait accompli, bore many of the hallmarks of a coup d'etat. Above all, the decision led, after four years of unprecedented military effort and civilian privations, to the Ottoman Empire's final defeat and subsequent dismemberment. Unsurprisingly, the decision was harshly criticized by contemporaries and subsequent commentators. The British diplomatic historian A.J.P. Taylor described it as a supreme blunder. And in so doing, he echoed the views of many Turkish commentators, from the anonymous authors of a general staff history published in 1922, to Yusuf Hikmet Bayur, whose magisterial history of the Turkish Revolution I'm sure requires no introduction here. To the critics, the decision was fundamentally irrational. It was gratuitous, avoidable, and bore no relation to the interests of the Ottoman state, properly understood. Some attributed the decision to nothing more than the irresponsible personal ambitions of a few leading men, and notably of the war minister, Enver Pasha, and the navy minister, Jamal Pasha. Others saw it as a product of megalomaniac dreams of territorial expansion, fueled by the ideologies of pan-Islamism and pan-Turanianism. At the same time, the decision for war has had its defenders. Three contemporaries who may be mentioned were Mustafa Kemal Pasha, war hero and subsequent founder of the Turkish Republic, the general staff historian, Colonel Bursalo Mehmet Nihat, and the historian and publicist Yusuf Akchura. Their arguments differ in their emphases, but they were at one in viewing the decision for war as rational and politic, given the Ottoman Empire's international situation in 1914. 
reduced to essentials, the arguments in favor of intervention on the side of the central powers, Germany and Austria-Hungary, were as follows. First, the Ottoman Empire had a considerable stake in the outcome of the European war. And a victory for the Entente powers by strengthening Russia could well prove fatal to it. A view reinforced by post-war revolution revelations from the uh, Russian archives, which showed that months before the war's outbreak, the Russian government had resolved to seize the Straits and the Ottoman capital at the earliest opportunity. In other words, the Ottoman Empire had a direct interest in a victory for the Central Powers. Secondly, given this, and the fact that the Central Powers lay beyond the Ottoman Empire's military reach, there could be no question of alliance with the Entente, and the Ottoman government's only practical options upon the outbreak of the European War were either to join Germany and Austria-Hungary, or else to remain neutral. Such neutrality would necessarily be an armed neutrality, for there was no guarantee that it would be respected. The British or the Russians might demand or seek to force the passage of the Straits, and the Empire's Balkan neighbors, Greece and Bulgaria, might be tempted into the war with promises of Ottoman territory. Some pointed to the example of Greece, whose efforts to remain neutral had resulted in a partial occupation by Entente forces and the establishment of a second government under Entente auspices at Salonika. Further, armed neutrality would require the mobilization of the empire's armed forces, and the Ottoman government lacked the financial and material means to sustain such a mobilization for more than a few months. Finally, neutrality implied continuing international isolation and risks with no promise of reward. Intervention on the side of the central powers would bring allies, opportunities to influence events, and, in the event of victory, the prospect of territorial and other gains. A further related debate concerned the effectiveness of the Ottoman intervention in the war. Were the military and political results achieved proportionate to the enormous material and human cost? Ottoman intervention in the war could not, of itself, be decisive. It was Germany which would win or lose the war for the Central Powers, in the principal theatres which lay in Europe. The Ottoman Empire's role was that of an auxiliary whose task was to facilitate a German victory. It could do so in four main ways. By closing the straits, thereby impeding the resupply and reinforcement of Russia by Britain and France. By drawing off and diverting Russian, British and French forces which might otherwise be deployed against its allies in Europe. By using the authority of the Islamic Caliphate and the appeal for a holy war, jihad, uh, to force the Entente powers to divert yet more forces to ensure the security of their Muslim colonial possessions. And finally, by sending Ottoman forces to European theaters to directly assist its allies. Critics have claimed that with the exception of the successful defense of the Dardanelles, none of the Ottoman Empire's military undertakings diverted substantial Entente forces. That the Holy War proved a damp squib and that such Ottoman forces as were sent to European fronts from 1916 onwards uh, were too few to make much difference. Indeed, it's been suggested that an armed neutrality with the implied threat of joining the Central Powers would have been just as effective in forcing the Entente Powers to hold back and divert forces as a precaution against Ottoman intervention. Similarly, it's been argued that the religious appeal of the Ottoman Empire and Caliphate to Muslims worldwide was a bluff, which might have proved more effective if the Ottoman government had not, by proclaiming a holy war, allowed this bluff to be called. As to the closure of the Straits, it undoubtedly made a contribution to Russia's eventual collapse, though one which has never been precisely 
calculated. But it's been pointed out that their effective closure from 27 September 1914 predated the Ottoman Empire's entry into the war. By implication, closure could have been maintained under conditions of armed neutrality. Such is the argument. A further subsidiary debate concerned the timing of the Ottoman Empire's intervention into the war. Some critics noted that contrary to initial expectations of a short war, the conflict became a protracted war of attrition, which the Ottoman Empire was ill-equipped to sustain uh, materially and morally, and which progressively exhausted it. In their view, it would have been wiser to postpone entry into the war for as long as possible in order to conserve the empire's resources, increase them where possible, and ensure its chances of surviving the war with minimal losses. In particular, it's been suggested that the failure of the Germans' Western offensive at the Marne in September 1914, well before the Ottoman Empire's entry into the war, should have served as a warning that the Central Powers would achieve no quick victory. Against this, it's been argued that the assumption of a short war, while erroneous, was an error shared by all the belligerents. As to the Man, it was not until the subsequent German failure in Flanders in mid-November that the stalemate was reached on the Western Front, and by then the Ottoman Empire had entered the war. Finally, it can be argued that the criticisms over timing, like those over the effectiveness of Ottoman intervention, miss the point by assuming that neutrality was a viable option. But what of the costs? Would it have been respected? And what would have been the Ottoman Empire's fate if the Entente powers had won? All the foregoing debates and discussions reflect the wisdom of hindsight. They shed no sure light on the calculations of the handful of men who led the Ottoman Empire into the war. Despite the best efforts of historians, not just me, uh, these calculations remain deeply obscure. The dearth of documentation is striking, but not surprising, given the way the Unionist-dominated government had been run since 1913, and would continue to be run throughout the war. Major decisions were taken informally, outside the normal official channels, by fluctuating groups of leading Unionist politicians, civilian and military, sometimes working with and sometimes against one another. It seems that very little was written down. At most, we can identify the chief protagonists of the protracted internal debate which began in late July 1914 and continued until the Ottoman Empire entered the war in the following November. The war minister, Anwar Pasha, the navy minister, Jamal Pasha, the interior minister, Talat, the president of the chamber of deputies, Halil, the finance minister, Javid, and the grand vizier and foreign minister, Said Halim Pasha. However, the terms of their internal debates and their individual motives and calculations largely elude us. Personalities, however, are not everything, and the various arguments from hindsight considered above do at least direct attention to objective structural features of the Ottoman Empire's external position in 1914 and suggest that when viewed from this angle, the decision for war was not self-evidently irrational. It's from this angle, too, uh, that I will now seek to approach the question of the Ottoman decision for war. How much time have I got? Five minutes. Five minutes. Okay, I'll compress it as much as possible. And if there's anything missing, you can get me in the question. <laughs> okay. The obvious point to be made is the Ottoman Empire's external position in 1914 was one of exceptional weakness and vulnerability even by the standards of the late Ottoman Empire. Ottoman weakness and vulnerability were not new. They could be traced back to the 1830s at least. And over the following 80 years, the empire had paid the price in successive losses of territory and sovereignty. Sources of this weakness were various, but in essence boiled down to commitments 
in terms of territories to defend and populations to control, which vastly exceeded the empire's military, financial, and administrative capabilities, and consequently rendered it vulnerable to military attack, subversion, and peaceful penetration by stronger neighbors, like the European great powers, and even by seemingly weaker neighbors, like the Balkan states. Efforts to modernize the Ottoman state in indirectly increased its vulnerability, as it found itself forced into dependence upon European capital markets and concessionaires. Nor could the empire rely on more powerful protectors or allies. No great power was ready to guarantee its extensive defense liabilities, and none possessed the means to implement such a guarantee, even if it had wished to. The empire's only alliance was the 1878 Cyprus Convention, which gave it a conditional British guarantee against Russia in Asia, but as early as the 1880s, it was unclear whether the British regarded this guarantee as still binding. Otherwise, the empire could look only to the European concert, that is to say, to the collective guarantees of its independence and territorial integrity issued by the European great powers under the 1856 Treaty of Paris and the 1878 Treaty of Berlin. In practice, however, the protection of the concert amounted to a form of internationalization not easily compatible with Ottoman sovereignty. A commitment to preserve the Ottoman Empire as a place on the map, but not to uphold the authority of its imperial government. Hence the willingness of the powers to respond to provincial insurgencies and crises by chipping away at Ottoman sovereignty under the banner of reforms, wherever this seemed the easiest course. In Crete, in Macedonia, and at one period in eastern Anatolia. Since the Ottoman Empire's military defeat at the hands of Russia in 1878, and the huge losses of territory, population, and prestige which resulted, most European statesmen have privately uh, regarded the Ottoman Empire as a lost cause, doomed to disappear sooner or later. But as a rule, they did not seek to hasten this outcome. Only the British, in the mid-1890s, made a serious bid for the Ottoman Empire's partition, without success. Rather, the power's practical approach to the problem of the Ottoman Empire was to make do and mend, though always with an eye to the possibility of its early collapse. On this basis, the Ottoman Empire was able to muddle through for a full generation after 1878, suffering periodic losses of territory, Tunis, Egypt, eastern Rumelia, Crete, but never the final collapse so widely anticipated in European capitals. By the early 20th century, however, it faced two new challenges, both largely beyond its ability to control. The first was the growth of European economic imperialism and the entry into this field of activity of new contenders, notably Germany and Italy, alongside the established British and French imperialists. The Ottoman Empire found itself a major focus of imperial rivalries, witnessed the Baghdad railway project and the international struggles which resulted. On the one hand, the scramble for concessions and economic privileges posed obvious dangers to the Ottoman Empire's territorial integrity and independence, and gave added impetus to fears that its ultimate fate would be partition. The example of neighboring Iran, divided since 1907 into British and Russian spheres of influence, was not encouraging. On the other, it conjured up the specter of the imposition of a system of direct European financial control, such as had been earlier imposed in Egypt and would shortly be imposed in Morocco, and which, of course, the French would attempt in 1910. The second challenge, and then I will shut up, um, was posed by the growing power of Russia, rapidly industrializing and modernizing and expanding its infrastructure and armed forces. This threatened the Ottoman Empire directly. Russia was known to have long-term designs on the Straits and the Ottoman capital, and would attempt to raise the question of opening the Straits to Russian warships in 1908, immediately prior to and during the Bosnian annexation crisis. Furthermore, in a reversal of previous policy, Russia would soon be seeking to actively penetrate eastern Anatolia through the cultivation of contacts with dissident Armenians and also dissident Kurds. It was not that Russia was seeking an opportunity to attack the Ottoman Empire, but it was concerned to ensure itself against the possibility of an early Ottoman collapse 
and determined to forestall the possibility that another great power might establish itself at the Straits or in eastern Anatolia in that eventuality. From the Ottoman point of view, this made little difference. The danger was that Russia's alarms would become self-fulfilling prophecies. The growth of Russian power, this is, I think, an important point, um, also threatened the Ottoman Empire indirectly through its impact on the other great powers, and the British and the French in particular. The British, deciding that they could no longer resist Russian expansion in Asia, sought instead to accommodate it through what Neil Ferguson has characterized as a policy of appeasement. The conclusion of the 1907 Entente, setting patent limits to Russia's ambitions in Iran, Afghanistan, and Tibet, coupled with the turning of a blind eye to Russia's ambitions in the Balkans, and a cautious willingness to consider Russian demands at the Straits. The French, similarly, saw their Russian alliance as the key to their security and great power status. They were ready to sacrifice Near Eastern interests for its sake. As would gradually become apparent, the Ottoman Empire could not count upon London and Paris to restrain St. Petersburg. Cutting it all very short, it seems to me that really from about 1978, that is to say, the year of the Young Turk Revolution, which is a complete irrelevance as far as the Ottoman Empire's international position is concerned, um, the Ottoman Empire is set up for a disaster. It's extremely exposed and vulnerable um, by the growth of Russian power, by the ways in which other powers respond to that growth in power, and by the growth of imperial rivalries. Obvious demonstrations are first the Tripolitanian War, second the Balkan War, both cases in which the Ottoman Empire is exposed to what even by the standards of the day is unprovoked aggression, and no power will come to its aid. The result by 1914 is that the Ottoman Empire is threatened in the not too distant future um, with some form of partition, with the possible creation of an Armenian state in Eastern Anatolia, and that it's been so weakened by the defeat in the Balkans in particular, its military prestige shattered, that it has no prospect of finding any serious ally or protector. In other words, from the Ottoman Empire's point of view, the outbreak of the European War in 1914 comes as something of a godsend. It had no interest in the preservation of peace. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Yasemida. <clears throat> now the floor is uh, yours, Professor Ahmed. You just press the, uh, press the green, green one. Oh, I, well, I see technology. <laughs> well, Professor Yasemi has <laughs> gone way beyond what I thought he would be talking about as a decision to enter war. Uh, my own paper, in a sense, is parallel to his. Unionist failure to stay out of the war in October, November 1914. Now, obviously, we all know the Balkan Wars were a turning point. Why? Not because of the defeat. The defeat was expected because politically the Ottoman army had been divided when the war began. But the isolation. Everybody had expected the Ottomans to win the Balkan Wars. The British, the Germans, the French, a lot. And so when they lost the war, it came as a surprise. But Lord Grey, the, fine, uh, the Foreign Secretary of Great Britain, had said there will be no change in the territorial status quo. But when they lost the war, no one lived with that promise. So they lost all their territories in the Balkans. So after 1913, the Ottomans, under the Unionist government, were determined to enter their isolation. They mustn't be diplomatically isolated. They must have an alliance. They tried to get this alliance with Britain, France, and even Russia, but were turned down. For reasons that Professor Yasmi has given, they were considered to be too weak. They'd be a 
problem for any alliance. So why form an alliance with them? They turned to Germany. The Germans said the same thing. Nobody wanted, even though the military mission of the Germans was there, even the military mission said the Ottomans aren't ready to fight. Their army is not really ready to do any fighting. It's in the end, Kaiser in Berlin says, we have to have an alliance with the Ottomans because they have the caliph and with the caliph they can declare jihad and with the jihad they can inflame the Muslim world. India, Egypt under the British, the Russians have got Central Asia, the French have got North Africa. There are literally millions of Muslims who will join this jihad. This was the German argument, at least the Kaiser's argument, and uh, his ambassador in Istanbul went along with it, and so did the military mission. Now, the Ottomans got this alliance on the day after the war in Europe began. Now, after this, they had absolutely no intention of fighting. The army had been reformed in 1914 by Enver Pasha. Its uh, officer class had been rejuvenated. The old uh, Ottoman Pashas had been retired. Young uh, Ottoman soldiers had come in charge of the party, of the army. But still, there was no decision to fight. In fact, the group that controlled the Committee of Union and Progress all agreed, we won't fight. The military alliance with Germany gives us a way out. It is against Russia and Russia alone. But we will only fight if we can guarantee that Bulgaria and Romania will be on the side of Germany. If they don't enter the war, we don't enter the war. Now, this goes on throughout August. In September, when the war is heating up, they make a very interesting and critical decision. On the 9th of September, they say, we are unilaterally abolishing the capitulations. From the 1st of October, 1914, capitulations will no longer apply to the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire will regain its sovereignty. And this was a very important measure. It was welcomed by the population and they played greatly on this in their propaganda. Now, the other problem, there were other problems, I mean, I can I'm not reading my paper, but you know, they sent missions to Sofia, they sent missions to Bucharest, which came back empty handed. This is in September. And they were able to tell the Germans, look, we are not going to enter the war. But at the same time, as early as August, they needed money. They'd declared their mobilization, which is going to be a costly affair, and they were broke. The Ottoman treasury was empty, so the first people they turned to were England and France. England and France refused to make them any loans, even though they had money there in the Ottoman bank, which interestingly enough, the Ottomans do not touch. Javed Bey, Mehmet Javed, is a man who is bourgeois to his fingertips. He says, we have an alliance, we have an agreement, that money is sacred. They don't touch it. So now, in September, they begin to turn to the Germans, to Berlin. Berlin says, well, if you enter the war, we'll give you money. To my mind, this is the principal cause why the Ottomans finally enter the war. They have to pay their civil servants. They have to pay the military 
which hasn't been paid for months. And so the first German loan comes in October. Another thing which requires my going back is Winston Churchill's decision to confiscate the two warships which were built, which were being built in Newcastle, which had been built in Newcastle. German, um, Ottoman naval officers had even been sent to Newca Newcastle under Ralph Orbay to bring these ships back. And then all of a sudden, the decision is made to confiscate them. There's nothing they can do, but there is great anger against the Entente powers, especially against Britain. And then lo and behold, a few days later after this decision, two German ships escape the British fleet in the Aegean and are allowed to enter the Straits and the Sea of Marmara. The Goban and the Breslau, everybody knows about this, the two ships. Now, great violation of neutrality. So what do the Ottomans and the Germans do? They say, we'll buy these ships. It's a fictitious sale. They buy these ships, but the sailors and the commander on board are Germans, Wilhelm Suchon. Now, the Admiral has said openly to the Minister of the Navy, to Jamal Pasha, listen, I don't take my orders from you, I take my orders from Berlin. There's nothing they can do. I mean, in a sense, the capital is hostage to these two ships. These two ships technically could bomb uh, the Sultan's palace or any other buildings they wanted. Of course they didn't. Now, to my mind, it's the money question. You know, it's as uh, Clinton said, the economy is stupid. Here, we should say, it's the money stupid. Where is the money going to come from, except from Germany? And the Germans, as they say, the price is war. You have to enter the war. And so, we all know about the Black Sea incident. Again, Souchon goes in. He is allowed to go in. He has been told to go in and attack Russian shipping at sea. But what does he do? He attacks Russian ports. He attacks ships as well, but he attacks Russian ports on the other side, the Crimea, etc. And this is clearly a declaration of war and a violation of any neutrality. The Ottomans hoped that if he'd only attacked ships, they would have said, well, look, these were incidents at sea. Russian ships attacked Ottoman ships, but this was no longer the case. And so in the end, it is the German decision. In fact, what I would like to emphasize here is that thereafter, it is a German war. It, the war is decided in Berlin. The Ottomans do not have sovereignty. But then, nor does Austria-Hungary in a real sense. Even Austria-Hungary is a failing empire. It is only allied to Germany in order to stay uh, in place. The Ottomans are hoping the same thing. They were hoping for a short war. They are still hoping for a short war. And they think, and here the army comes in, not Enver Pasha, but his generals who are with the military mission. The military mission is constantly telling them, look, we're going to win the war, and then, if you don't join it, you won't be part of the peace process, which would, have, which would have been true. And so, the military, in a sense, are willing to fight. But again, it's the Germans. For instance, if we go beyond November, Sarakamish. Who makes the decision to fight in Sarakamish? the Germans. Why do they do it? Because they want to draw 
Russian troops away from the Austrian front. The Austrians are having difficulties. After this, of course, Gallipoli. Everybody knows that the Straits are in danger and so they fortify them. The Germans help to fortify them, to mine them, and of course this plays a very critical role on the 18th of March when five Entente ships sink. After this, the war continues. You know, we think that the Ottomans made a mistake in entering the war. And looking back, you can say, yes, they did. But in 1918, I mean, I'm jumping forward just as a conclusion. In 1918, when the Germans, Ludendorff launches his final offensive, what turns out to be a final offensive, starting about April, May, it looks as though Germany is going to win the war. And when Germany wins the war, the Ottomans are going to make a lot of gains. At that stage, during the summer, they're asked, look, we're going to win the war. What are your war aims? What do you hope to get out of this war? What do the Unionists say? They say, we want to regain the Arab provinces which have been conquered by the British. We want those back. We want Egypt back. Egypt, which has been out of Ottoman control since 1882, if not earlier, if you take Mehmed Ali Pasha as an autonomous valley. They say, we want Cyprus back. Cyprus is vital for the defense of Anatolia. When you read about Ottoman thinking at this time, what are they thinking? They've given up on the Balkans. They've given up on Central Asia, except they want Central Asia as a buffer between a new Russia and the new Ottoman Empire. What they hope to do is to establish a dual monarchy kind of regime, just like Austria-Hungary. Even Prince Sabahuddin, who has got nothing to do with the government, has said the same thing to the British. We will have temporal power in Istanbul. The Sultan will rule in Istanbul. We will give the Caliphate to the Arabs in Damascus. And there we'll have the dual monarchy. This is something they've been discussing throughout the war. So, yes, in the end, on the 7th of August, Ludendorff says this is a black day for the German army. The final offensive has failed, and with it, all Ottoman dreams. Soon after that, you know, you read about Talat, who's gone to Berlin to meet uh, his German counterparts. He's coming back. He comes to Sofia. He wants to see uh, the ruler. The ruler says, sorry, we are about to sign peace. And Talat says, you should have waited. We should have done it all together. So he goes back. Soon after that, you have the Ottoman armistice. And so ends the war. But what I suggest is that they didn't make the decisions. The decisions were essentially made in Berlin and they had to respond. But once they responded, they thought we may as well go into the war. And interestingly enough, they were never threatened by revolution. Russia had its revolution. The Germans had their revolution, partly. There were mutinies in the French army, etc. The Ottoman Empire was, as you like, still backward. It didn't have a working class which would rise up. There was banditry. People who deserted became bandits. But there was no revolution against Ottoman entry. Have I finished? 
Thank you very much. Oh. Thanks a lot, Professor Ahmed. Now, uh, Gül Tokay, Dr. Gül Tokay. Uh, öncelikle bu uh, organizasyonu yapan arkadaşlarımıza, uh, kurumlara uh, çok teşekkür ediyoruz. Ayrıca uh, bizi de uh, davet ettikleri için tekrardan çok teşekkür ederiz. Uh, ben e, aslında çok emin değildim sunumu nece yapayım diye ama organizasyonla konuştuğum zaman hani çoğunluk e, konuşmalar İngilizce olduğu için ve bu oturumda İngilizce olduğu için İngilizce yapmayı şey yaptım ama tabii soru cevap da e, Türkçe olarak da yapabiliriz. The, the, pub, e, the topic e, of my presentation is Ottoman diplomacy and the origins of World War One, 1912-1914, a reassessment actually. People who are familiar with my work, actually Professor Yasemi and Ahmad, there might be some overlapping information of my previous presentation because it's part of a larger project I have been working and too many information pop up at the Ottoman archives at the moment. So therefore, it's a, it becomes a never ending story actually. And secondly, uh, it was mentioned at the earlier se uh, session for the purposes of the language and the terminology, I decided to use how it's stated at the sources rather than the most commonly used in the Ottoman historiography. Yeah? And that, I think, is another issue in the historiography of the late Ottoman period which needs to be revised. Uh, after giving this little introduction, I can move to my paper, Ottoman Diplomacy and the Origins of World War I. My paper basically investigates the origins of the Great War through the correspondence of Ottoman diplomats between 1912 to 1914, namely from the formation of the Balkan League until the August 2nd, 1914. Yeah? However, the emphasis of the paper is A, on the question of Edirne or Adrianopoli as it's stated in the Ottoman uh, foreign ministerial documents and after, secondly, on the restraining of the uh, Anglo-Ottoman relations on the eve of the Great War. Yeah. For the British Foreign Secretary, Sir Edward Grey, one of the origins of the regional origins of the Great War was on the question of Edirne. When the Ottomans recaptured Edirne during the Second Balkan Wars, Russians threatened the Turks to enter into Ottoman Armenia if they were not to evacuate the town. Yeah? And there was already an existing tension escalating between the Germans and the Russians. This situation added up with the Liman von Sanders affair a couple months after, made a Russia-German understanding agreement irre irreversible. Yeah, and then the situation bloody escalated after, as we are going to discuss a little bit uh, throughout the paper. Within this framework, I decided to discuss, go a little bit back, and then decided to divide the paper into two sections. Firstly, we'll be reassessing the Balkan Wars with the issue of Edirne, and secondly, the developments after. Yeah. Um, although the great powers always criticized the Ottomans on, their Christian, on, on the treatment of the Christians and supported their emancipations, there was two major there were two major reasons which led to the formation of the Balkan League and the finalization of the League leading to the path to the Balkan Wars. The first one, uh, it was the escalation in the Austria-Serbian tension. Yeah? It was mentioned earlier on uh, today, but I think after 1908, this, the tension kept on uh, escalating, particularly under Austrian foreign minister, uh, which replaced Erdentar in 1912, Behold, uh, he made no secret 
to support of an Albanian state at the expense of Serbian and Montenegrin ambitions, yeah? That no doubt led the Serbians to look their own ways. This is the first reason. And the second reason, uh, which finalized, in my opinion, more or less the uh, Balkan alliance, was the Italian occupation of the Dodecanese during the Turco-Italian War in May 1912, yeah? There's two things which became an ongoing issue, in my opinion, until the 1914, you know, until the uh, break of the war. In the meantime, what were the Ottomans doing? Uh, with the escalation of the Albanian and Macedonian turmoil, I'm going to cut uh, a very complicated story short, Ahmed Muhtar Pasha was trying to ease the te regional tension through reforms and concessions. However, the developments as such um, became in September 1930 that there was a triangular deadlock. You know, basically, the great powers, the Ottomans, as well as uh, the uh, Balkan powers, could not come to a solution or to consent, which made a war inevitable, the Balkan wars. But all hoped to keep it localized. Yeah? It was under the circumstances. Um, uh, Ottomans signed the peace treaty with the Italians, and the day after, they, uh, br uh, they broke up the relations with the Balkan states, and state of war was um, started, in that opinion. At the beginning, all the great powers declared their strict neutrality and no change in the status quo. However, if we go through the dispatches of Gabriel Efendi, the Ottoman foreign minister, in November, the Ottoman defeat was inevitable, and uh, obviously there was going to be a change in the status quo. And then soon after, in early December, a ceasefire was uh, signed and decided the conferences should take place uh, in London. Uh, because it's not the topic of today, so I'm not going to go into the details, but two conferences, as we know, uh, were taking place in London. One was among the signatories of the Berlin Treaty, the Great Powers, where they discussed issues which were the outcome of the war, but they thought it was too important to leave to the Balkan allies, such as the establishment of the Albanian state, the uh, Serbian outlet to the Adriatic, and of course the question of the Aegean Islands. I think some emphasis needs to be done on the Greek occupied islands in understanding the path leading to the Great War. Yeah? For the Ottomans, they were only concerned about two issues. Yeah? The first one was they would never give in on the Greek occupied islands, on the Aegean, and secondly, because of the geographic and strategic proximity, the Edirne, they had to keep it. So when the Allies refused it, okay, the talks stalled, but soon after uh, the January coup 1913 did take place, there was, uh, Mahmoud Shevket formed a new government with Said Halim which was leading us to the Great War, uh, becoming the foreign minister, and the hostilities soon resumed. On the international arena, um, of course, this, all the questions I am just bringing up is based on the Ottoman documents and open to debate, of course. Yeah? Uh, on the international arena, the great powers mainly acted despite their differences uh, with their counterparts, you know, with their, uh, in part in, of their league. Uh, like the British, as usual, great, had an open-ended uh, role and mainly went together with Russia, I would say. And, um, Maybe we are going to look at the next session a little bit on detail, but there was also a shift in the German foreign minister because Kidal and Wechter died in December and was uh, replaced by Yagov. So, um, according to the Ottoman reports, I would say, the German foreign policy was also uh, determined by pacifism, as the Ottoman diplomats call it, and they went together with the Austrians, yeah, mainly related to the Balkan politics I'm talking about. Under the circumstances, Ottoman defeat was inevitable, as we know, 30th of um, May, the Treaty of London was signed, many issues such as the Aegean, Albanian, and finances was, were left on the um, uh, ambassadors, and Ottomans lost the west uh, of the Enos media line, including Edirne. This, that, uh, their main purpose was from then onwards to regain Edirne. This is very important, yeah? And uh, when the Second Balkan War 
uh, started, uh, the powers recommended to Ottoman Empire to keep its neutrality. But in July, things changed a bit with the Bulgarian defeat, with the Romanian entrance, and etc. Ottomans declared war on Bulgaria. Soon after, they regained Edirne. The regaining Edirne is very important because it created an outcry, not only in Bulgaria, but in most of the European capitals as well. Particularly the Russians were threatening to enter into Ottoman Armenia if the uh, Ottomans were not uh, to evacuate the city. Furthermore, Sazonov, the Russian foreign minister, tried to have a naval demonstration plus a provisional occupation of Armenia, but despite Gray was acting uh, with uh, his Russian partner, rejected in both cases. But the tension started to escalate, and at the same time, uh, the Germans, particularly the, uh, the Yagov, started getting a little bit edgy and was saying, if the circumstances in the eastern provinces were to change, they would not be able to stay quiet for long. Yeah? With that ten tension escalating, um, the, the, the, the, the, the uh, great tried to, to little bit ease the situation, but no luck. But what they have been doing is, um, when we go again uh, through the Second Balkan War, actually, uh, there is uh, the shift, yeah, many uh, problems related to the Balkans remained unresolved, but uh, the focus, the core, started moving to the eastern provinces. As it was under the circumstances, A, the Treaty of Bucharest was signed because it was the intervention of the European powers and invitation by the Romanians, and this left the Ottomans to sign a separate uh, agreement uh, with the uh, Bulgarians in September through the mediation of Palavicini, the Austrian minister, where the uh, Ottomans kept a journey. This is very important for three reasons, you know, more than. Uh, firstly, uh, the Palavicini mediated the Austrian ambassador uh, because once um, he wanted to win to Ottomans and the Bulgarians to Tripolis, to the central powers. Secondly, the Bulgarians uh, wanted to gain the support of the Ottomans against the Greeks. And then thirdly, to avoid in the, the possibility of in a coming war, any hostilities between Bulgarians and, uh, uh, Bulgarians and the Turks. When we, uh, after the war, it became obvious uh, that on the issues uh, now I will be looking at bit the restraining between Anglo-Ottoman uh, relations in the last section. How many minutes do I have? Seven? Five? Five. Maybe I bargain a bit, you know, because this is some new information we are uh, gathering. Okay, during the course of the Balkan force, it goes without saying Ottomans further detach themselves from the British, and the British on the issues which were not directly involving themselves, like Armenian issues, like other always went despite not necessarily interested with its Russian partner. This is very important, yeah? Uh, second, yeah, so they were acting like a consortium, more or less. Um, furthermore, um, uh, also it's not only on the international arena, but the influence in Istanbul. You know, the British embassy after the 1908 revolution started to lose its influence in comparison, for example, to the German ambassador Bieberstein of Wangenheim or the long-serving Palavicini. Maybe they um, recovered a bit with Le Mallet on the eve of the war, but then again, the new appointed uh, British ambassador was too much pro entente echelon of the CUP. So always thought a compromise might be achieved between the British and the Ottomans. Yeah? So he a little bit misread the developments, I would say. Uh, it was mentioned, and I always keep on saying this, um, when we look at the kind of a duration of Sir Edward Grey between 1906 to 1916, there is a kind of a shift in Ottoman-British uh, relations. You know, it started a little bit more friendly, then it got a little bit disinterested. And then, at the end, the relations on the eve of the Great War was 
this was sort of a hostility, and I think that was mainly for two reasons. The first one was, the, of course, the British ties with Russia, but also the British stand on the Greek-occupied Aegean Islands. Yeah? I'm not covering this, but in the questions we can, because it's for, for, for the purposes of the presentation, I did not mention the Aegean Islands so much, but it's an issue we should need to, to be looking at, uh, looking at uh, going to the Great War. Uh, but the relations, you know, despite whatever it said on the other sources, according to Ottoman documents, the relationships were serious harm only after the Britain declared war on Germany on the 5th of August. Yeah? Uh, I'll be a little bit faster. Um, on the Sarajevo assassinations, this is very interesting, again, uh, going to the Ottoman documents. The Ottoman diplomats, at the beginning, didn't take it that serious. You know, they looked at it as a regional affair and then thought the, um, the, the situation would be eased with the Serbian concessions a bit, yeah? And, but, or the war would be kept localized. However, when, they, uh, when it became obvious that it was going to be in one, all, most of the great powers, there was a split of decision among the Ottoman diplomats. Yeah? Like Tevfik in London, Fahrettin in St. Petersburg, Azim in Tehran, they all said Ottoman have to keep strict neutrality through the, uh, throughout the war. Yeah? However, uh, and also it was advised by their counterparts as well. But an alliance in the mind of this diplo very established diplomat, a kind of alliance with one of the entente was out of question, despite the development of what was happening. Yeah? This is, but on the other hand, uh, in Berlin and Vienna, Muftar Pasha, German educated, and Hilmi Pasha, who was in Vienna, they said Ottomans should join the war, uh, not the war, but uh, one of the, uh, with the, with the Tripolis, without wasting any time. That was the only way they could keep together. Uh, when, uh, and this is also, if you little uh, go through the uh, sources, um, when uh, Bahot sent the Serbs on the, when was it, if, uh, uh, 23rd of July, this, the last ultimatum, and then the Serbs uh, rejected it, and then when the uh, uh, Austrians declared war on the Serbs, I think, on the 28th of July, the very same day, the Ottoman ambassador, Hilmi Pasha, goes to see Bahot. And Bahot says, oh, we just declared war on Serbia, and then Hilmi says, we always had sympathies with you. And we are just, and, and then open, and this is before the, of course, the um, Ottoman-German uh, alliance. On the other hand, um, there were serious concern in the capitals of the Entente powers. Gray was trying his, again, his usual, not spiel, but trying to come to ease the tension and coming to a conference. Uh, because, but he still emphasizes um, that the origin, uh, the, the Balkan origin, not the Balkan, but the question of Edirne, um, which made the hostilities, which which made the war not uh, more or less inevitable, but uh, for him, he always was very much concerned on what happened during the Second Balkan Wars, when the Ottomans didn't evacuate Edirne, uh, Russians threatened to enter Armenia, and what followed. You know, that was, that was making everything, everything irresist irreversible, yeah? Uh, however, more than this, uh, story, um, it was the, the upper, the, the pro-German uh, Enver Pasha, you know, when uh, Said Halim went to uh, propose an alliance to the Ottomans, uh, to the Germans uh, on the 27th, and on the 2nd of August the alliance was formed, but here again, um, Yagov, when we look at the sources from the Germans, the Ottoman sources coming from Berlin, the Wangenheim, and Yagov knew the Turks very well and never wanted to sign an agreement. And there we see the role played again by the Austrian ambassador, uh, Palavicini. Yeah? And it was again through his mediation, again his influence, and then for the reason that we can discuss a little bit more detail after my presentation, uh, it was under his influence that a treaty of alliance was signed uh, with the Germans on the 2nd of August. However, um, after this uh, signing of, uh, for my last, last two sentences, Ottomans, A, mobilized their forces, the first one, and uh, secondly, but at the same time, declared strict neutrality. Yeah? 
and uh, yes, and then when Tefik went to see Gray, the Ottoman ambassador, uh, he said yes. Uh, nobody knew, of course, uh, um, about the secret alliance. They said the mobilizations were only for defensive purposes, and uh, through the war, uh, they were just gonna keep strict neutrality. Yeah, and similarly, uh, in Saint Petersburg, Fahrettin Bey did the same uh, with the Sazonov, and uh, both of the entente foreign ministers foreign secretary and foreign minister said, as long as Ottomans declare their neutrality, not, no challenge would happen uh, to their integrity. But things were a little bit different to finish it up in Berlin and in Vienna. Um, Muftar said, uh, also he knew the rumors of the 2nd of August alliance, uh, said, Entente was like a consortium. So whether interested or not, uh, they could not act unilaterally. Yeah, and therefore a British friendship or British unilateralism could not be um, a, a safe uh, garden for uh, for the Ottomans. And uh, secondly, Muftar said neutrality would uh, Ottoman Empire not was not financially and uh, militarily strong enough uh, to keep neutral. So what they were saying, basically, the Hilmis and the Muftars, was that uh, Ottoman has no other choice uh, than joining the war um, uh, with the with the triplets even though they were not sure about the alliance so uh, th this is very important so it also it's not only in the Ottoman capital but uh, also among the envoys the split uh, was basically more than obvious uh, among the envoys let's say to finish it up uh, of course there is pros and cons of how they perceived it, the uh, Ottoman diplomats above, but it's how it's viewed through the, uh, the Ottoman diplomatic envoys, the origins of the Great War leading uh, to the Ottoman-German alliances. That's it. Thank you. Well, I thank you for, uh, for the speakers for these stimulating talks. Uh, the floor is open uh, for discussion now. Thoughts, remarks, questions, please. Efendim tekrar teşekkür ediyoruz bu e, güzel konuşmalar için e, değerli e, katılımcılara. E, şimdi e, soru e, ya da işte düşüncelerinizi paylaşabileceğiniz bir e, aşamaya geldik. Sorularınızı sorabileceğiniz. Memnuniyetle bekliyoruz. Herhalde bir beş dakika belki en fazla on dakikalık bir aramız var. Daha sonra öğle yemeğine e, çıkılacak. E, ya bekliyorum. Ya konuşturmadın bize biraz daha <gülüyor> Tamam, şimdi sorularda sana bolca vakit. <gülüyor> Buyurun. <gülüyor> Herhangi bir şekilde soru olabilir, yorum olabilir, fikirlerinizi paylaşabilirsiniz. Buyurun. Teşekkür ediyorum. İngilizcem yetersiz olduğu için Türkçe soracağım. Tabii elbette buyurun. Sarın Fer Sayın Feroz Ahmet'e konuşma sırasında e, şeyin Prens Sebahattin'in ikili bir monarşi düşündüğünü söyledi. Yanlış anlamadım değil mi? Osmanlı sisteminde böyle bir yeni bir sistemin kurulabilme ihtimali neydi? Yani Osmanlı hükümeti gerçek anlamda buna nasıl bakıyordu? Anlatabildim mi? Tekrar ifade edeyim. Prens Sebahattin'in evet, Prens duydum. E, ikili bir monarşi yani Araplarda evet, bir evet, halifelik evet. yani Türklerde de sultanlığın devam edeceği bir ikili monarşi kurmasını söylemiştiniz. Kurmayı düşündüğünü söylemiştiniz. Bunun Osmanlı hükümetinde bir karşılığı var mı? Osmanlı arşivlerde hükümetinde e, karşılığı uygulanabilirliği yani gidip siz araştırma yapınız isterseniz. In 1914, Prince Sabahattin talks to the British intelligence agent and offers him this. Sabahattin has no uh, 
position in the government. He says to the British, if you win the war, this is what we'll do. The Ottomans, uh, with a Committee of Union and Progress, are saying the same thing. In fact, quite early on, the Ottoman government asks the ambassador in Vienna, uh, um, Hussein Hilmi Pasha, can you investigate exactly what the dual monarchy is so that we can implement it in the Ottoman Empire? That's about all I can really tell you. Evet. Beş on dakikamız var. Rahatlıkla tartışabiliriz. Buyurun. Buyurun. Buyurun. Uh, this is also a question to uh, Professor Ahmad. I was a bit surprised at your use of the term dual monarchy for what is in effect an equivalent to the medieval idea of having emperor and pope. It, a dual monarchy, as uh, obviously we all know from Austria-Hungary, means that in personal union, the emperor of Austria is also king of Hungary. So it's basically what you might call a federal empire. So uh, the suggestion that the sultan should reign in Istanbul, quasi the Turkish part of the empire, and the caliph probably in Mecca, so the Arab and Arab part of the empire, this doesn't resemble to me a dual monarchy at all. It is rather suggesting to me that what Prince Bahadid was suggesting is that uh, the Arabs should be pacified or uh, should be tied closer to the empire by giving the honor of uh, manning the, the highest position Islam has to offer. Thank you. Quite so. That's exactly what they were thinking. They lost the Balkans. Now if they were going to have an empire, it would be Anatolia plus the Arab provinces. The religion, of course, is going to be Islam, but these people didn't, believe it or not, take religion all that seriously, so they said, give the caliphate to the Arabs, that will tie them to us. I mean, not exactly a dual monarchy, but that was the model they were looking at. İzninizle ben de Türkçe devam etmek istiyorum. Ee, yine Ahmet hocama, e, Feroz Ahmet hocama e, şöyle bir şey yönlendirebilir miyim? Yalnız benim bilgisizliğimi affetsin bazı konularda. E, 1918'de Alman, yani Osmanlı e, stratejisinin biraz Almanya'ya mahkum olduğundan bahsettik. Yanılmıyorsa yani eğer yanlış anlamadıysam ama Şöyle düşünebilir miyiz acaba? Mesela Filistin'de İngilizler önünde e, oldukça dağılmış bir orduya sahipken aynı sırada Bakü'ye kadar ilerlemiş Türk orduları var. E, ve e, bu kadar ihtiyaç duyulan bir cephe yine Almanların organizasyonunda devam ediyor ama diğer tarafı hiç Almanları bulaştırmadan Bakü'ye kadar ilerliyorsunuz. Hatta Gürcistan'da Almanlarla yapılan çatışmalar var. Bu acaba Osmanlı yöneticilerinin kendi inisiyatiflerinde de bazı stratejik hedefleri olduğunu gösterir mi? Osmanlı çok bağımlı bir aktör mü yoksa kendi içinde ilginç bağımsızlıkları var mı? Benim kafamda böyle bir soru yaratıyor ama bilgisizliğimi affetsin bu konuda. Okay. Well basically really how dependent were the Ottomans to the uh, to the uh, central powers I, I mean put this on I couldn't really hear him uh, right, properly right. it was all blurred but anyway tell me were the Ottomans uh, in a state to take um, their decisions on their own or were they really dependent on the um, central powers? I mean, how dependent they were or why couldn't they take uh, their own decisions? They were totally dependent on the central powers. They'd given the army to the central powers via the military mission. 
Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, it was about uh, maybe uh, I should talk in English, please excuse me. Uh, I was saying that uh, the Ottoman armies in Palestine was uh, in, dis in a form of disintegration, but at the same time uh, the Ottoman armies was uh, advancing towards Baku. And even by then in 1918, and even by then uh, they were uh, acting independent from Germans. I was asking about that. In the, the Caucasus hmm. in 1918. So uh, may we say that the Ottoman uh, decision makers had some kind of independent strategies. I don't know, forgive me uh, about uh, asking that such kind of question uh, uh, if I'm not too good about history. How, how fair is it to say that the Ottomans were really totally dependent on the, on the central powers, on Germany, because they were acting uh, independently in the Palestine, uh, Palestine or Palestinian front? Not Palestine, yeah, but I mean, uh, uh, the Caucasus. Caucasus, Caucasus, uh, Caucasus uh, sorry. Caucasus. 1918, Baku. Because in 1918 they'd signed Brest-Litovsk, if you look at that treaty, the Germans do not give any autonomy, in a sense, to the Ottomans at all. All the Ottomans regain are the territories they lost in 1878. Now, you're quite right. With the loss of the war, the army tries to act independently. That's about it. But otherwise, throughout the war, the Ottoman Empire has been dependent on the Germans, their, the army, the navy, finance, and virtually everything else. They have a government, but the government has to listen to what Berlin tells them. Thank you. I'm giving you my opinion. I may be wrong. No, there's nothing. Thank wrong. you very much. Uh, en arkada bir arkadaşımın elini gördüm. Evet, buyurun. Hi, I'd like to say a welcome to our visitors to Istanbul begin with. Um, here comes my question. Anybody could answer this. It's not towards a particular person. But what I'd like to answer, ask is, um, you were mentioning about Turkey taking a, a decision to go on a war, but what they couldn't see was the revolution was coming up afterwards. But what I'd like to, obviously this might be your personal uh, opinion, how about Westerners, Western countries such as United Kingdom, Germany or France, could they see this revolution was coming up? Thank you. Do you mean do you mean the nationalist revolution in Turkey or do you mean the Bolshevik revolution in Russia? Um, no, the Russian revolution in Turkey. In other words, did anybody foresee that even after the loss of the First World War, the Turks would still be in a position to fight on? Yes. Is that the question? Yes. Fine. To the best of my knowledge, um, nobody really foresaw that, though at the end of the war, when Enver Pasha escapes, and of course the situation in the Caucasus and Central Asia is still very obscure and unclear, uh, there are fears that he might try and start something up there. But I think, as far as Anatolia was concerned, nobody really foresaw it. Okay, thank you. Well, I don't know whether I would agree with that because one thing which the Unionists did was to spread this whole notion of an autonomous Turkey, autonomous Anatolia. So it depended, I mean, before Mustafa Kemal takes over the leadership, there are all kinds of association called the defense of rights. They want to defend their rights. The other thing you have to remember is Europe is exhausted. The only place they are trying to intervene is Russia. For them, the Ottoman Empire is a secondary issue. 
which they leave to the Greeks. And Greece, the Greek army invades, as you well know, 19th of, 15th of May 1919, and they've been told by their chief of staff, Metexas, that look, you don't have the means to go inside Anatolia and fight whatever guerrilla army there is. But Venezuela doesn't listen. The British are behind him. They're saying, carry on. We are behind you. Of course, they don't help at all. And the Greek army suffers a disaster in 1922. So the Ottoman army under Kazim Karabekir was intact in eastern Anatolia. The rest, Mustafa Kemal is able to organize and fight against the Greeks. Thank you. Belki son bir soru alabiliriz. Ondan sonra bitireceğim. Eğer varsa, yoksa da kapatacağım bu bölümü. Yok gibi görüyorum. Peki. Çok teşekkür ediyoruz. I think that brings us to a close. We have a lunch break now. We need to be back here at 20 past two. Thank you for the participants again for these stimulating talks. Thank you.